Hi, I'm here with a, a second lecture, a sort of a, a continuation or follow-up on the lecture immediately prior to this. Um, once again, taking, taking up this, uh, this general topic of the relationship between science and religion. Uh, in the last lecture, I tried to show uh, the, the sort of parody or the, the, the connection between the two and tried to illuminate the ways in which science and religion, they form a kind of uh, a complementary relationship um, in, in, in kind of uh, emphasizing two different elements of, of human life. I, uh, I used uh, the, the, the principle of Hume's fork, it's sometimes called. Uh, this is meant to illustrate what's sometimes called the, also the fact-value distinction or the is-ought distinction. Um, the quantity quality distinction, also we could call it, um, and this is just the idea that uh, that um, you know science would would concern one one um, one element of life, one aspect of life, which is uh, the way things are, the facts of the matter, um, you know the quantity quantitative elements of the world, whereas religion w uh, is suited to uh, to concern itself with the more qualitative elements, the the value. The, uh, the, the the value of uh, life, the values, and uh, you know the how how things ought to be. So religion would concern itself with ethics. Uh, science would concern itself with knowledge. Um, there was a famous biologist in the 20th century named uh, Stephen Jay Gould, and he uh, he famously referred to uh, to the kind of science and religion as um, as separate magisteria, separate magisteria. And so his idea was uh, each of them were sort of um, you know, institutions that that had a jurisdiction, but in kind of uh, in, in separate separate domains of human life. So uh, you know, mutually exclusive in some way uh, uh, elements of human life. That um, that uh, you know, there's a certain territory for science and a certain territory in religion, and they're different territories. So he uh, is very much uh, affirming this this uh, you know Hume's fork, this fact value distinction. And uh, there's certainly something to it, and, and I hope uh, that the last lecture was, was helpful in, in uh, you know, just uh, achieving some kind of conceptual clarity on, on this, one, this one approach to, uh, to the issue before us. Um, but I think as we, go, as we go deeper, we will see in some ways in which that, uh, that, that same approach is maybe a little bit inadequate, and it's perhaps a little bit too simplistic. Um, and so that's what I actually hope to do in this lecture, is, is carry these thoughts a little bit further. And um, and and I'll do that uh, I'll do that presently. Before I go into uh, into anything further, though, I thought it might be helpful to um, to show this diagram that I actually drew as a kind of um, a pictorial representation of the principles uh, from from uh, the last lecture. And so I'll just uh, place this here. Uh, what I've done is I've placed a, a circle in the center. And it actually says self. If you can trace the letters, it says S E L F in a sort of a circle there. And as you can see, the the self is a sort of uh, nexus point. And you can see uh, that there's a fact value distinction um, on on the one side, and a, a religion science distinction on the other side. And so religion uh, falls squarely on the value side. Uh, science uh, follows on the fa uh, falls squarely on the fact side. And as you can see, the self forms a kind of a center. And then uh, the world, as it's written above, is the uh, kind of peripheral element. And so I'll just uh, place this here, and I hope that the viewer has an adequate view of the, the diagram. Um, I thought that would just be helpful as a way to um, kind of graphic representation uh, of, of some of the, of, of the approach that we took in the last lecture. Um, and so once again, uh, what I would like to do, though, is sort of use some of the ideas from the last lecture as something of a departure point to actually uh, inquire further uh, and, you know, just explore this topic and, and actually uh, reveal elements that uh, don't fit so neatly into that, um, into that uh, conceptual distinction from the last lecture. And so this lecture will roughly fall into, uh, into two parts. Um, they will both be in service of the same thing, which is uh, once again, uh, you know, under this broad, uh, broad rubric of the relationship between science and religion. Uh, but one way I hope to uh, hope to illuminate this relationship is through a kind of uh, historical or diachronic approach to the question. So trying to get a sense for uh, the respective nature of science and religion, uh, how they uh, might have. Um, the, the, the development of them, the evolution of them through time, through human history. So that will be the first uh, half of this lecture. Uh, and the second half will be uh, more of a synchronic approach. And uh, once, you know, having laid out that, uh, you know, that the historical or, or diachronic 
vision, then I think uh, we will have prepared uh, groundwork to really, um, to really try to uh, you know dive uh, and, and penetrate to some of the real uh, crucial crucial elements of, of this question. And um, and so uh, with um, with any luck, then uh, you know that by the time we finish with this lecture, then it will be um, we will have discovered something. So. Uh, I will, without further ado, I will dive into the first part. This is once again the diachronic element, and then the second half will be the, the synchronic element. Um, w one thing to just consider is that uh, science is a, uh, both science and religion are act actually, are terms that might not have, um, they, they would be almost, uh, they would be almost irrelevant or inapplicable to a time um, actually before the modern period. And that might be shocking to many people, and uh, people would imagine that that um, either science has been around uh, as long as human beings have, or uh, religion has been around for as long as human beings have. And there's certainly something to that. Uh, before, though, uh, in, you know, in order to even think about this question in the first place, it's necessary to to get some idea of of uh, what we mean by those terms and kind of uh, defining the terms science and religion. Um, and really, science was not used uh, in the context that it's that it's used today until um, until uh, you know roughly three three hundred or four hundred years ago, and it's really a, a figure called Francis Bacon who uh, who, who is uh, in some ways um, sort of like the figurehead of science, and, and he is uh, he's credited in, in many ways with with actually um, differentiating uh, science from uh, from. What, what might have been thought of as more comprehensive philosophy before that. Um, and uh, Francis Bacon famously uh, drew on this, this Latin term, scientia, uh, and which is, uh, in English has become the word science, uh, to refer to a specific kind of knowledge, actually, and a very specific kind of knowledge. Francis Bacon um, delineated uh, a, a very crucial distinction between, um, between you know, knowledge broadly construed and scientific knowledge. And his idea, actually, and this takes, you know, this um, a topic like this could could uh, as a kind of um, it's almost like a hologram <laughs> that contains uh, so much of, of intellectual history for the thousands of years, really. And so, um, in, in going through this exploration, I have to be careful to balance, um, you know, adequate uh, breadth and adequate context with uh, with with also uh, uh, sufficient focus, so so that we don't go off on too many tangents. But this element with Francis Bacon might be worth just um, just exploring a little bit because I do think it provides uh, some important context to understand uh, the, the real the significance of um, of this distinction that he's making, and he, he's basically coming out of the uh, what might be thought of as like a twilight of actually Aristotelian science, Aristotelian physics. Uh, it wasn't called science exactly before that; it was called natural philosophy. Uh, and Francis Bacon came and he wanted to, uh, to sort of stake out a new discipline and sort of throw off the yoke of tradition, is Francis Bacon's idea. And he was really speaking as a mouthpiece for the spirit of the times. This is around the time of the Renaissance and then, uh, and then the Scientific Revolution and the Enlightenment. And this whole period is characterized by a, by a spirit of the time that's uh, kind of uh, revolutionary and, and novel and again really trying to start out as kind of a... Um, uh, Again, sort of throw off these these uh, these fetters of of the past, uh, throw off the, the, the shackles of, of tradition, and so Francis Bacon was very much um, uh, speaking in that spirit, and uh, he he uh, what he did is he um, he sort of re rejected a certain element of, of uh, Aristotelian physics, uh, Aristotelian natural philosophy, and uh, once again, this, this, could be, this could constitute a whole uh, exploration in itself, and so I, I, I can't afford to go too deeply into it, but basically from, uh, from Aristotle's perspective, sometimes called hylomorphism, uh, it, which it, it refers to uh, a way of, a way of uh, basically making sense of the world. Um, hylomorphism, it's a, it's a compound word, and hyle uh, is actually the Greek word for wood. Uh, and highly, it, it, it refers to the, the stuff that something is made out of, often called the matter, the matter of something. So uh, if you have, for instance, a cup, uh, the cup will be, it will have a certain matter. This is, of course, ceramic. And so if we wanted to understand the highly of the cup, uh, the material cause of the cup, the matter of the cup, the stuff of the cup, we would say ceramic. Um, the cup, though, uh, the ceramic by itself, obviously, the matter by itself, 
the uh, hule by itself, which is uh, again another word for wood, um, that, that's a, maybe a necessary condition for the cup, but it's not a sufficient condition, obviously, because you don't call any ceramic a cup. It has to be ceramic that's specifically in the form of a cup. Uh, and so this is the, the second element of the, that compound word, hylomorphism. Morphe is a word that Aristotle often invoked to refer to exactly this form. Uh, and so the, the fact that the, the, the matter of the, of the ceramic has actually been in some ways um, stamped or impressed by a form, uh, that's what, that's, uh, that is a, another necessary condition for the cup. Uh, and if you have uh, one of them by itself, uh, you don't really have a cup. Uh, they they uh, are complementary elements of, uh, of basically reality, is the way that Aristotle sees it. And, and in fact, this was called realism, uh, this view. It's called Aristotelian realism up until the scientific revolution. And that's when a, a significant uh, shift actually happened. And um, uh, before long, realism actually referred to almost the opposite of what, Arist what it would have meant only, only uh, a, few, a few years before and what it still means to anybody who um, is familiar with Aristotelian philosophy. Uh, so, again, the idea of realism is that uh, the substance of something uh, is actually constituted of two elements. Uh, and one of those is the stuff that it's made of, the hule, the matter, the material cause. Uh, and the other is the form, or the idea, often called the eidos in Greek, the idea. Um, and that's, uh, that's again, the, the, um, the, the, not the matter, but rather, uh, you know, not what something is made of, uh, but what that thing is that's made of uh, the matter. So uh, the fact that this is a cup, that's because its uh, form or its idea, its eidos, uh, its morphe, is a uh, cup. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's significant to notice that we, uh, we refer to something, we call something by its uh, formal cause, not by its material cause. So I don't call this ceramic. Uh, unless I'm in a, um, you know, unless in a strange circumstance. I don't call this ceramic, I call it a cup. So I'm referring to it by its formal cause, by its idea, by its morphe, um, by its, uh, by its, um, yes, uh, I, uh, form, uh, formal cause, morphe, idea. Um, I, hope, I hope that, the, you know, the meaning of those terms now is clear, because, because then we'll be in a position to understand Francis Bacon's uh, revolutionary um, influence which was to uh, circumscribe the domain of science, the magisterium of science, to use, uh, again, Stephen Jay Gould's terms. Uh, the idea is Francis Bacon uh, says uh, natural science is going to concern itself with uh, the material causes of things, the matter of things, the hule of things. By the way, Aristotle uses hule, uh, to, uh, hylomorphism, he uses hule, the wood, as a um, something like a, a metaphor uh, for, uh, for uh, for uh, material cause, for matter, because often, and he often uh, uh, enlists examples of something like a bed, which is obviously constructed out of wood. Uh, again, so the wood is a, a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition for the bed. Um, so, but in any case, uh, Francis Bacon, this is in the 16th century, um, he, he, he uh, delineates and uh, defines, stakes out the territory of, of scientific inquiry. And uh, he, he describes it as, um, uh, basically, well, what he does is he rejects the study of formal causes. He says forms are the figments of people's imagination, the imagination of philosophers, he says. And he says scientists will study the material cause and not the form. And so now what we do is, uh, well, scientifically today, we don't refer to this as a cup. We refer to this as ceramic. We don't refer to this as ceramic, we refer to this as um, whatever are the chemical elements that constitute ceramic, um, probably carbon and, and so on, and hydrogen, I'm sure, um, phosphorus maybe, um, calcium, who knows, the many different elements. And in some ways we don't even really refer to it as the elements, we refer to it as uh, you know, subatomic particles maybe, uh, and even fundamental forces. Um, uh, I guess, so what I'm indicating is that uh, it's kind of a, it's almost a, well, it's, it's clearly a process of, uh, of analysis and almost, um, and there's almost a pro problem of infinite regress if you uh, are, uh, you know, not, if you, if you are, have bracketed away the study of formal causes, um, you will always be trying to describe things in terms of what they're made of, and you will have a difficulty in uh, actually 
um, describing things themselves. This is uh, uh, Francis Bacon's ideas actually uh, go part and parcel with a, again a, the, the whole the entire scientific revolution. This revolutionary um, this revolutionary change in uh, or re revolutionary um, kind of invention, I guess, of a new a new discipline, a new way of thinking about things, and um, and so so Francis Bacon is just one one eminent figure in this in this entire shift. Um, that uh, he's he's he Francis Bacon lived around the same time as as uh, of course people like Galileo and and, and John Locke lived shortly after. Um, but I, I I think it's worth just um, just uh, establishing a little bit more context around this this uh, you know re really crucial time in order to understand uh, to go back and then have 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 significant uh, groundwork to really understand this uh, the the relationship between science and and religion. Um, uh, at the same time as Francis Bacon, and, and these are in, in some ways very similar things, um, uh, scientists started to differentiate between uh, what what has been actually uh, most commonly now referred to as primary and secondary qualities, and these are actually uh, terms that that the philosopher John Locke gave to this distinction, and the distinction basically um, basically encompasses uh, between um, elements of 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 a of any phenomenon that are quantifiable, that can be expressed in terms of quantities, uh, and those elements which can't. And the elements that can be, uh, be uh, expressed in terms of quantity, those elements are called primary qualities for people like John Locke, um, but also but Francis Bacon himself and, uh, and Galileo and Rene Descartes, all of these, uh, you know, extremely, uh, these sort of uh, patriarchs of the scientific, the, the, of, of modern science, um, all of these, these, uh, these figures, is, you know, often in their own way express the same distinction that, that Locke uh, may be expressed in the clearest way. Um, and he, he wrote, uh, literally, in, in, uh, this is in 1690, he wrote, um, the primary quality of, of bodies um, do really exist in the bodies themselves. So again, uh, the primary qualities are the, the um, elements that can be quantified. Um, and uh, he, he actually he describes these as uh, bulk, figure, and motion. Um, and so again, you can you can measure the dimensions of something. Uh, you can uh, you can measure the um, you know the, the proportions of something, and you can measure the, uh, the 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 motion of something, the forces of something. Um, but he but he indicates it you know in, in the same uh, in the same. It's, this is from the essay of uh, an, an essay concerning human understanding published in 1690. He he he, uh, he he points to the secondary qualities of things, which are uh, basically what you really experience about a thing. And so he he gives examples of sweetness, a blue, or warmth. Um, but the idea is like these uh, qualitative elements of something, the elements that you experience um, in in uh, I don't know in your in your actual experience. Because I, I'm just pointing to the, the the obvious fact that we don't immediately experience the quantity of things. Um, when we experience the quantity of things, it's because we've uh, we've uh, kind of translated what we immediately experience into, uh, I I as qualitative uh, experience, we've translated that already into, um, you know, this, this mathematical or quantitative language. Um, you might say, well, if there are three apples on the table, then I experience the quantity of three. Um, but, but, uh, but not really. You, uh, I mean, you ex what you experience is uh, redness, you know, uh, if you eat it, it's sweetness. Um, and, uh, and, from, and, and then if you start to conceptualize the apples, then you've again started to translate the situation into, into different terms. Um, and so, but, but so again, uh, I, I'm, I'm just indicating two different ways to, to think about the, this, uh, this fundamental rift or this fundamental uh, departure that science took from uh, almost like the, 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 tree of the tree of philosophy in some way. It's like a, a departure, a ramification. Um, again, a, a departure from the central, um, uh, the, the central uh, trunk of this tree. Uh, and that's uh, that. Uh, people like Francis Bacon and John Locke are articulating during this time, again beginning in the in the 17th century, sometimes in the 16th century. For example, with uh, Copernicus's publication of the um, the heliocentric doctrine. Um, but so Francis Bacon, we uh, we just uh, saw one uh, way in which he distinguished um, science from natural philosophy, and that was by indicating that science would study the matter of things, the stuff of things, and it would leave uh, the forms uh, to uh, the study of the forms to uh, some other discipline. Um, and in, in a similar way, uh, people like John Locke, uh, but also Galileo. Um, Galileo says uh, something very similar to what Locke says um, about just the idea, uh, just the idea that that um, 
things seem to have there seem to be quanti uh, quantifiable elements of things um, that that are in some ways for Galileo and for Locke and for all of the modern scientists. Hence, uh, these things are more real than the uh, what John Locke calls the secondary quality uh, secondary qualities. Um, we would call the first uh, the first the primary qualities. We would call those quantities. Uh, and so uh, this was again, uh, but the, uh, a fundamental uh, division or distinction that uh, science uh, science. Uh, began with with this uh, this kind of distinction, uh, and the idea is like the the, the secondary qualities, uh, you know, whatever we immediately experience in our in our um, in our consciousness, these things are somehow um, we might use the word subjective today, uh, and by that we would indicate that they were somehow less real than the objective qualities. The objective qualities would be the uh, the quantities actually in uh, in in language that we would use today, uh, and and this is again another uh, you know. It, it sort of uh, um, almost like a, a, a keynote of, of science is the um, the kind of uh, the study of uh, the study of objective qualities and in some ways uh, somewhat ironically um, the, the rejection of uh, of experience of firsthand experience and that might be some of, something of a shock uh, because we um, we have a kind of naive belief that science is always about uh, you know empiricism. Uh, but and that's partly true. But there are many uh, ways in which it's also um, in the the precise opposite of the truth. And I hope that I've uh, you know with this distinction I've showed uh, at least one way in which it's the opposite of the truth. And in fact, uh, keep in mind this this distinction, please. The uh, the idea that that science um, operates actually by a kind of um, uh, uh, by discarding firsthand experience, the experience of a of a, a you know um, of uh, the, any the only experience that we know really, which is uh, first you know first person experience, um, part of the scientific method is actually to uh, to um, to reject that. This will uh, this will come up again uh, in a very um, you know interesting and somewhat problematic way in respect to uh, to quantum mechanics, which is again it's a it's a de development that happens um, centuries down the line from from people like John Locke, but. Um, there's a there's a, a direct evolutionary relationship between this distinction that John Locke is setting out here and the one that Francis Bacon is setting out. There's a direct evolutionary relationship between that and some of the difficulties that we encounter now with with quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity and specifically trying to uh, mesh the two of them. Um, and so I uh, so I hope that's that's clear by now. Uh, this uh, the kind of uh, just so something of a. a you know, a groundwork in, in terms of um, understanding the the um, the initial uh, the initial definition, the way in which science defined itself against a tradition that had uh, against the traditional um, way of way of knowledge, which was uh, before Francis Bacon gave it the name science. It was uh, you know the, the idea of knowledge was gained knowledge about nature was gained through what was called natural philosophy. Um, Okay, and so, uh, but so now I want to return to this idea that before you know, again, the seventeenth century, uh, people would, it wouldn't have made sense to talk about science and to uh, to contrast science with religion in the way that it seems natural for us to be able to do today. Um, and, uh, and part of the reason is because science, you know, hadn't even been defined in this way. But there's another reason too, and a maybe more fundamental reason, um, and this is that. Um, Science, in order to operate, you have to have uh, you have to have certain um, you have to accept certain axioms about what kind of place the world is. Um, you have to believe the world is a place that, for example, lends itself to be understood uh, through these methods that I've uh, you know in some ways um, at least uh, suggested you know and, and somewhat outlined the idea of being able to uh, to be able to study things in terms of their their uh, material causes and not their formal causes to be able to study things in terms of their their hule and not their morphe, to be able to study things in terms of their uh, their stuff and not um, not their not what those things are, but rather what they're made of. Okay, um, you have to think the world in a certain way to uh, to believe that that's that's an adequate way of, of learning about it. Um, and, and just just for a, an easy example, um, even just just taking this this lecture and and, and uh, you know this exchange this speech uh, that's transpiring right at this very moment. Um, you could never, uh, you actually wouldn't have an adequate understanding of what's going on here 
um, if you only, even if you had an exhaustive characterization, which you never would, but even if you, even if you had an exhaustive character, uh, characterization and and um, if you had exhaustive knowledge of all every single one of the the physically measurable parameters of uh, of this present scenario, this, this scenario that's transpiring exactly at this moment. Um, you know all of the atoms and the, the the movement of particles and the motion and the spin and the and, and you know all of the the fundamental forces and, and and everything no matter how much knowledge of that sort which is all kind of uh, again um, you know uh, material knowledge uh, not physics knowledge of physics you would never have an adequate understanding of what's going on uh, because primarily all of this is just serving again as the kind of uh, the, um, the 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 matter for what's actually the the the, the ideas that are, are being communicated. So you might uh, think with just with any speech, um, you certainly you can learn something about the noise and the vibrations and the sound waves and so on. But what you will never learn uh, by that by that approach is, um, you know, in some ways the cause of the sound of the noise in the first place, which is uh, the meaning that is uh, meant to be conveyed. Uh, in some ways, sci uh, scientific the, you know the scientific method in some ways systematically leaves meaning out of the consideration. Um, so I think already something, uh, a picture of, of uh, you know, this relationship between science and religion. I hope it's already beginning to constellate based on uh, really trying to understand the, the, um, the phylogeny of, of, of science itself. Um, now you have to imagine that the world is the kind of place that, uh, in which meaning, for instance, is a secondary quality and not a primary quality. In other words, you have to imagine that meaning is something kind of like an afterthought, like a, um, like a subjective addition to uh, an objective world that's complete in itself without meaning. Yeah. So I hope, that's, I hope that example is clear, uh, the example of speech, where you can, uh, if, even if you, you can study the, the sound and the noise and the vibrations, um, and you can learn something, again, but what you won't learn is, in this case, um, arguably, again, arguably the cause of everything that you do learn, um, argu arguably the, the logic of it, the logos of it. And then, I mean, literally, it's the logos of it. Uh, and so, so I hope that's clear by now. You, but you have to, in order for science to make sense, you have to presume uh, to know, um, which is something you, you could never prove. It doesn't make sense to be able to prove this. And so the idea that, you know, something like, something like the idea that the world is, is comprehensible in terms of material cause alone, um, that's, something that, that, that's never something that can be subject to evidence. It's, it's, it's absurd to say it's like, uh, you know, evidence-based in that respect. You're always going to uh, depend on... on in order for something to be evidence-based, you're always depending on on a set of axioms that themselves are not subject to that same evidence and that same that same uh, method of, of of inquiry. I hope that's clear, and in some ways it should be it should be self-evident in some ways. Um, and and but it, so in order for science to work, you have to have a kind of uh, like an a priori faith that uh, the world is the kind of place that can be adequately understood uh, purely in terms of quad, quad, Quali uh, quantitative, excuse me, quantitative, and you know, in some ways, uh, well, unconscious, um, and in some ways, meaningless elements. Um, and uh, you know, uh, on the contrary, if you don't think the world is that way, then it really won't make sense to try to study it in that way. Uh, and this is, I guess, what I indicated as the kind of the more uh, fundamental reason that science is a comparatively recent um, concept, even. It's that before, uh, you know, before roughly 300 years ago, people, uh, people did not think the world was the kind of place that could be adequately understood um, in terms of uh, material cause alone. Um, there are, of course, there's of course exceptions to this, but, uh, but we have to, you know, in some ways make generalizations to, in order to identify any kind of um, historical trend. You always, uh, you always have to... Um, I mean, this itself, it's almost as though once you, once you start to explore a question like this, everything becomes, a, it's like a, there's a fractal structure to, uh, to just uh, meaning, I guess, because um, I wanted to say you have to be able to, to select uh, certain trends, certain, uh, certain elements of history, certain stories, um, and discard other ones, and you're, you're, you're selecting them based on the ones you think are most illustrative. And so uh, I talked about Francis Bacon, for instance, and uh, somebody else, John Locke, uh, at the expense of, you know, all of the millions of other people that I could have talked about. Why did I choose those two? Well, I, it was for the sake of illustrating a point. Uh, in, a, in the same way, um, in the same way, uh, in, in order to, to uh, you know, try, try to meaning, meaningfully present a history of something, you have to, uh, to tell a story in the first place, you have to select 
um, certain things as uh, and, and give a priority of value to certain things over other things to tell an intelligible story in the first place. Like you, if you, uh, if, every, if in every fairy tale you read, you had to learn about the the barometric pressure and the the weather on the planet Venus, and uh, you know, and so on and so on and so on. You would never get to a story. You would not have a story. You would just have a, an assemblage of uh, just like a, a pile of, of facts. You would just be shoveling shoveling facts upon facts upon facts upon facts, but with no no value to structure them. And so I hope this is clear how uh, you know this this kind of repressed element of value. It will always have to return in some way or another. It just even if it's merely in the in the process of selecting what is worth conducting a scientific experiment on, for instance. Um, and so, uh, but so again, uh, before now, I'm speaking again as a generalization. There will always be exceptions to this, but like I said, I'm, I'm uh, choosing to to make this generalization for the sake of illustrating what I do think is a, a significant um, point and a certain uh, a significant trend in, in evolution. Uh, before the scientific revolution, as a rule, people did not think that uh, that the world could be adequately understood in terms of uh, matter and quantity alone. Um, instead, of course, through uh, uh, you know, th for, for throughout the Middle Ages, for a large part of the world, certainly in, in Europe and, and, and West Asia, um, people believed that uh, that everything that you encounter is in nature is somehow um, you know the the immediate uh, product of creation by a benevolent godhead, and um, in, in that sense, it's 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 uh, in some ways perfectly ordered, um, uh, perfectly ordered uh, to the, the logos, and uh, so there's nothing. There's nothing without meaning in that sense, and, and this is where Aristotelian realism, uh, you know, was very congenial to a view like that, or it, or it served as a kind of uh, uh, almost like a support structure, scaffolding almost. Um, just the idea that certainly things are uh, made of matter, but but that's not what they are. <laughs> that's what they're made of. What things are is um, is something uh, you know something something. I guess immaterial, for lack of a better word, and this might sound superstitious, but but in some ways it's self-evident. It's just like um, you can never find. Uh, it's the same relationship that that uh, stands between a whole and its parts. Uh, another way to reiterate what Francis Bacon did is to, uh, in some ways, um, indicate that science would study parts <laughs> and leave the study of wholes to some other discipline, uh, and because the idea would be like, well, wholes are just a figment of the philosopher's imagination is uh, something that, to, to paraphrase Francis Bacon. And, uh, you know, he, in some ways he's right, but he's only right if you already presuppose the method that he's, he's, tr he's trying to lay out. Uh, if you don't presuppose the method that he's trying to set forth, then uh, it's not at all clear that he's right, and it might be, uh, in, in fact, you, you might have serious reservations about a study like that. It's hard for us to say this today because uh, science has, uh, in some way, it's become, I mean, like we've become fishes in the ocean of science in some way. Uh, we take it in with our mother's milk, so to speak. Um, you know, speaking for myself, but also I think for a, you know a large part of the the culture in the world, we just assume that if you want to know what kind of place the universe is, ask the physicists. You know, if you want to know about about origin of species, ask the biologists, and so on and so on. Um, and again, I mean, there's a, there's certain truth to that, but I'm just uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, attain to a more critical view of things uh, and and leave um, leave. Uh, Leave uh, childish things, uh, leave naive views uh, behind, and so uh, and so you you have to believe uh, that that the world is intelligible in terms of quantity alone. If you don't believe that, which uh, you know people as a rule did not believe that until Francis Bacon, then the methods of science would seem um, you know almost a little bit uh, ridiculous, I guess, and and you could come up with a more pejorative uh, pe pejorative uh, 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 description because. It would seem to be reducing. It would be, seem to be like uh, you know really deleterious and and reductionistic, I guess, uh, to understand things that are obviously to understand holes merely in terms of their parts. Um, so it's obvious that every hole has a part. But I I think in some ways it's just as self-evident that um, that uh, the parts themselves are not identical with the whole in, in in a certain sense. In other words, the whole is what gives identity to the parts is a way to look at it. It's like the part doesn't really exist by itself. It exists because it, again, the whole is its identity. Um, that might be sound somewhat abstract, but if, but just for instance, if I um, if I point to my nose, you might say, uh, you know, you know. If, so if I point to my face, for instance, and think of that as the whole, um, you might say, uh, is this my face? And somebody could say, no, it's it's you know, a cheek. Is this my face? And somebody could say, no, it's a nose. 
and you realize wherever you point, it's not going to be the face. <laughs> so, uh, so what are you left with? Um, again, you're left with uh, only parts. And then again, if you take any single part, you will again find a sort of dissolution under analysis. Like if you point to the nose, somebody will say, no, that's not a nose, that's the tip of a, tip of a nose, for instance. If you point to the tip of the nose, they will say, no, that's not a tip of a nose, that's uh, subatomic particles, and so on. Uh, the, uh, and, and I hope that just illustrates the way in which it's a kind of infinite regress until you get to something that, that uh, I don't know, you can't see, and, and it's not clear that it really exists in the first place. I mean, the subatomic particles are notoriously, um, they're notoriously intractable, they're, and they're notoriously... Um, not fully actual, not fully existent. They're virtual in some sense. You know, they exist most of the time in a sort of superposition. Um, and, uh, you know, according to, to uh, recent quantum mechanics. And so, uh, and so again, I just, I hope that that illustrates the, um, you know, the, the difficulty, the one-sidedness of uh, trying to uh, understand things merely in terms of their parts. Before the scientific, re scientific revolution, natural philosophy did not approach nature in that way at all. And in fact, it wouldn't have made sense to approach nature in that way at all, because again, the sort of uh, the general paradigm, in the sense of uh, in, in the Thomas Kuhn sense, the idea of like a an organizing uh, worldview that that just it structures your approach to what kind of place you think the world is, that changed with the scientific revolution. Before that, again, the world was seen as um, you know a kind of a direct product of God's handiwork. And it would not occur to you to study it as though it were something other than that. And so the, the methods of science would be ill-suited to a situation like that. We see a kind of evolution now kind of picking up forward in time from there. It's first uh, the advent of the scientific revolution. Uh, God becomes something like a, um, the, the watchmaker God or the God of the deists. And the idea is like, well, uh, God is not uh, actually so close uh, and you know, so, um, so intimate to the world. Rather, uh, God made the world in the distant past and now has kind of uh, uh, withdrawn, drawn back, and so, but, but sort of ordered it so that the world follows natural laws. Uh, and then gradually you, you have um, you know, epochal moments in which uh, God increasingly is seen as a sort of something to be like a placeholder uh, for, for lack of an adequate explanation. Um, interestingly, and I, I don't mean to be too critical of science, forgive me, but it's, it's just... Um, now you see that, that same, the, the role that God used to play, it's been replaced by something like chance, or randomness, or uh, infinite time, um, or uh, probability or something. And so when, when people used to say, well, the reason that, um, you know, the reason that the, the world began, for instance, or that, that life <laughs> evolved, uh, is because God. And um, this is kind of like God of the gaps hypothesis, but the idea is like this is something as provisional, and ideally science will uh, scientists scientists are basically um, seeking for a for something uh, for a more substantial explanation in, in their view than God, and and so then when for example when Darwin uh, posits this way in which natural uh, you know the evolution of species and the, the evolution the descent of species can be explained not by God but by chance. Um, then, uh, then this is immediately integrated into the scientific paradigm. Uh, again, it's it's kind of a balance in this lecture to uh, not everything is so um, so uh, inherently related to everything else that it's uh, really a challenge not to go off on too many tangents. Uh, but but obviously that comes with its own set of difficulties. The idea of explaining something by chance, and um, in some ways we might think of chance as uh, a situation in which we are. Uh, lacking an explanation, and so we call it chance, and that if we really knew the explanation, we we um, would say that, and the chances, again, uh, I'm not sure how different it is. It, I'm not sure whether it is any different in terms of serving as a mere placeholder. Um, but again, that's uh, a separate topic, and, or I mean, it's not a separate topic at all, but it's uh, it's a topic that uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to just uh, set uh, set set down um, to, again, try to take us back in time. Uh, again, uh, through the Middle Ages, the, this paradigm was thought of as, again, as God somehow um, having created the world and was in some ways um, not distant from the world at all. Uh, before that, you know, and, and uh, before before the, the, the kind of... Uh, um, um, uh, 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 Hebrew uh, Hellenic synthesis that uh, Christianity represented, um, uh, that that kind of you know achieved a, a, you know a somewhat of a regency during a thousand years almost in in, in Europe and, and East Asia uh, West Asia during the Middle Ages. Before that time, um, and and in some ways this is all relative. It's it's almost as though. Um, 
you know, these are just, they're almost like state in the, in analogous to stages in human life where everyone, you know, goes through a period of, of adolescence, for instance. Uh, but, but, uh, everyone goes through that at a different time and it obviously depends, you know, uh, and so, but, so there's a, there's a, there's a similarity in, in the sense that the, the, the epoch or the stage is the same. And there's also a, a diversity, which is that people go through it at different times uh, and, you know, according to when you were born and, and a number of other factors. Uh, in the same way, uh, I'm, you know, we're, I'm following a specific tradition uh, right now in this historical traverse and, and other, other cultures go through, uh, could go through similar uh, transitions just at different times. But, uh, but you know, if you, if you uh, work your way back, you discover that, um, for example, the, the ancient Greeks, they uh, would not have thought uh, once again, the idea of being able to study things uh, in the scientific way is kind of objective and conformable to, to, uh, to you know, lo quantifiable, quantitative, mathematical laws of nature. Um, that couldn't have been further from from the view of uh, people like Homer and and uh, Hesiod, for instance. You know, in the in the seventh, eighth century BC, um, because because again, it it would it would just be uh, totally um, totally irrelevant and impertinent to the paradigm. Again, this is the paradigm is like a way of thinking what kind of place the world is. Um, if, uh, basically, uh, it, it would be just as absurd to uh, to explain the, um, the 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 world in terms of uh, you know quantitative mathematical laws and, and, and scientific laws. It, w it would be just as absurd to try to explain the world in that way, the, the ancient Greek world in that way, as it would be to um, to uh, you know try to exp try to uh, tell. Um, tell the story of Hamlet through physics or something like that or try to tell any actual any event that we experience through physics um, uh, and you don't actually have to it's not very hard I mean you don't have to search anywhere for an example take anything that you experience um, to try to describe that in terms of physics would be unrecognizable to you because it you would only be talking in terms of um, again uh, to use John Locke's terms bulk figure and motion um, we call those different things today we would call that like momentum mass spin of particles, you know, and, and, and waves and so on. Um, and so, so I hope this is uh, clear in some way, the way in which um, there's a sort of procession of paradigms, a transformation of paradigms, and uh, by paradigm it's again this, the, the, what kind of place you think the world is. And what we call science is actually uh, very, very extremely specifically situated in a specific paradigm. And uh, this is something that, that again, uh, names like Thomas Kuhn, but, but even thinkers like Goethe, uh, were, uh, were had uh, had articulated this and, and tried to draw attention to this fact that um, the, the the methods that we have the scientific methods they are they're specifically a function of a certain uh, view of what kind of place the world is um, and and so this is to say they um, like any method it uh, it's it's as good as you know it it's uh, it, will re it will it will reveal what it's designed to reveal. Um, but by the same token, it will conceal uh, everything or just ignore um, everything that is not designed to reveal. This is today what we find, the, again, this kind of the, uh, the, the tines or the prongs of, of Hume's fork. Um, we have a situation in which science is suited to, uh, again, to disclose the facts, so-called facts of the matter. Um, and religion is, uh, you know, tailored to, uh, to, um, uh, to structure our understanding of of uh, values, I guess, ethics, and um, but we see how problematic this is, and how it's uh, you know uh, it's Stephen Jay Gould's idea of, of separate magisteria. Um, this is a kind of a, you know it can be an extremely problematic truth, um, unfortunately, uh, and because and, and we so often see this in terms of just the the politicization of science. Um, and, you know, science is, is not designed to uh, to say anything in terms of here's what you ought to do. <laughs> Uh, by again, by its design, by its method, as outlined from the very beginning, uh, science is not saying this is good, this is bad. <laughs> That's those are secondary qualities. Uh, it, you know, those are extreme examples of secondary qualities, to use John Locke's terms. Those are things that science should really have no say in. It should just be, it's like just uh, reporting the objective facts. And if you decide this is good or this is bad, those are already political, if not ethical, if not moral, if not religious questions. Um, and so again, this is uh, this is very it's, it's, it's problematic what we are seeing. I think increasingly, but all along, the way in which um, science is sometimes used as a a uh, almost like a Trojan horse to introduce 
um, religious elements, and, and whether you call them uh, religious elements or not, they're religious in the sense that they are they are speaking to um, to, uh, to, to to value, to absolute value, to uh, you know to moral questions, to questions of uh, hierarchy of, of action, which again are uh, fundamentally not scientific questions. Um, we see this with science being being used as a, again a kind of weapon to justify one or another policy. Um, that's what we see today. Again, though, going back, um, the, 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 imagine the, the prongs of Hume's fork. Um, they, they obviously, if you go back in time, again, like I suggested before, uh, people like Francis Bacon, uh, you will not, it, it, it will not occur to people that it's, a, that it's sensible to distinguish these two things. Um, again, because you have a situation in which uh, the world that we live in and the immediate experience that we have, um, uh, it's always, uh, um, we're never just experiencing facts by themselves. Um, we're always experiencing, in some way, facts as the um, as the, the the matter of meanings. <laughs> and in fact, the experience of meaning is is uh, foremost uh, in first person experience. Um, and so I hope that's that's a you know that that historical that that diachronic view. I hope it um, I hope it serves to some in some ways uh, kind of you know. If having arrayed the, the, this before us, I hope it serves to uh, as a kind of um, you know a context or a, a foundation um, to help us to further kind of deepen and in some ways problematize this uh, this neat division of science between science and religion between uh, you know fact and value. Um, the last thing that's worth mentioning is just like um, th this this goes along t together with the idea of science uh, kind of. As a uh, methodologic, methodologically exclusion of uh, first-person experience, for uh, you know defensible reasons. Obviously, there's many things that can kind of uh, bias or sway or influence a first-person experience, and um, so in itself, it's not necessarily wrong. I think it, that being said, I think it does become problematic when um, when the the method is sort of um, extrapolated into a, a metaphysical view, into a paradigm, so that the method is, you know, the, the method or the theory or the model, it's treated as evidence. Um, and this is unfortunately common. Uh, and again, I think this is problematic. Uh, the method itself is not good or bad itself. So um, it's just a question of how it's, how it's used. Uh, but I just, just to kind of, uh, again, uh, emphasize, I guess, the distinction and the idea of, of science kind of uh, rejecting first person experience. Um, for uh, for, uh, for for like pre scientific person, um, to to look at the stars, for instance, um, there's a certain experience that goes along with seeing the the night sky above your head, and this kind of uh, almost it has a quality of of harmony, of of perfection, of uh, divinity, even eternity, certain certainly, um, and and the idea might be like, well, we've uh, we have we have sort of disproven that. Like we've gone, flown to the stars, flown to, you know, sent probes out to the uh, farthest reaches of the solar system, and we've kind of revealed, uh, we've, we've discovered the horrible truth, or the horrible truth exactly, and, and just being facetious, but we've discovered that it's just as chaotic out there, it's just as much of a mess out there as it is anywhere else. And, um, and what we're really dealing with are uh, not, you know, gods or, or uh, symbols of, of angelic intelligence, hierarchies of angels, like they might have thought in the Middle Ages, uh, you know, heavenly spheres, spheres of intelligence. Um, but but what we're instead dealing with is just uh, you know just uh, matter and force, like anywhere else, like anywhere on the earth. Um, and and so we might think like, well, the primitive notion, the primitive paradigm has been disproven. So uh, you know, all maybe it's like all things being equal, but now we have evidence actually to the contrary. But again, I think that's somewhat. Uh, I think that's actually extremely naive. And a more critical view will not lead us to that conclusion at all. And instead, what we'll have to say is, um, you know, by the rejection of, of first-person experience, um, there are just certain things that are not amenable to study anymore. And one of those is, uh, again, what I described, uh, looking at the, the, the stars. Um, you might you might say, um, you know, there's a there's an experience that goes along with that. By analogy, and and you can't exactly disprove that experience by going out into space because then. I mean, you're not actually looking at space anymore. This might seem strange, but but just by analogy, um, we all are familiar with the experience of a rainbow, for instance. And again, there's a certain qualitative, uh, you know, pr uh, secondary qualitative. Uh, there's a qualitative exper experience that goes along with seeing a rainbow. 
And, and you might say, uh, and, and I mean, so the question, I guess, is uh, does the fact that, that if you went and, and uh, you know, performed chemical analysis on the rainbow or, you know, even just went into the rainbow that it would not be there, uh, does, that, um, does that itself uh, invalidate the phenomenon of a rainbow? And, um, if, you know, from the scientific perspective, the answer is yes. Uh, but again, I think uh, most people, or, you know, or at least it's defensible to have the sense that, um, that uh, no, it doesn't, and that, that there's just something that's missed if you insist on this, you know, this specific method of, of acquiring knowledge, and that uh, there is an experience of a rainbow, and that itself can be, um, can be grasped as a certain kind of knowledge. Maybe you don't call it scientific knowledge, but then you can call it something else. Um, so in the same way, um, you know, space or the stars or the heavens, that meant something to ancient people. That is not, that doesn't disappear merely because we go and explore it in a certain way. It's just that we're rendering it kind of invisible to ourselves by, by approaching it in that way. Um, and, and, you know, in the same way, the, 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 the ocean is kind of the same way. It's like the ocean has a quality of, of, uh, of power, certainly, and also of kind of like mutability or chaos even. And if you, uh, you know, begin to learn about the ocean and then you send uh, submarines and all kinds of things and you, again, probe and penetrate the ocean, um, you certainly learn a lot and I, and I uh, entirely support, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of um, uh, initiatives to, to, to study the, the maritime, uh, the, the ocean and, mar and marine biology and so on. Um, but I also uh, think that that, that that itself doesn't disprove the, the you know, more traditional, more ancient view that there's a, there's a phenomenological um, approach to things that, uh, that is not disproven merely because science doesn't include that as its method. Okay, so I hope that's, uh, that's helpful by now, uh, you know, just in terms of, again, laying out a, a kind of historical vision of how these things uh, would have, um, would have uh, I guess, emerged. And I guess the way to think about it is science has a, you know, very specific, um, very specific point in history at which science, that sort of um, gave birth to science. Um, before that time, uh, in, in a way it almost, it's like a, a kind of mutual, um, not mutual annihilation, but mutual genesis. Uh, in which the, the moment you have science, you have a, a polar, polarity of uh, religion, you know, everything that's not science against it. Um, not everything that's not science, but uh, almost the kind of anti-science against it. And uh, that's certainly what we, what we have seen today. It, it didn't emerge immediately, but I think it's the, it's the still, uh, the seeds for it uh, did emerge at that time, you know, at the scientific revolution. And, and then, you know, more recently we've seen the fruition of those seeds. Um, if you go back further, far enough in time, you, um, um, uh, you know, imagine again this, this tree, I call it the tree of knowledge, but we can uh, just call it like the tree of, the tree of human culture. And um, at a certain point you have a, you know, a, a, a proliferation of ramifications and branches. But the further back you trace it, the, the more you start to converge on a single, um, uh, you know, a single root, so to speak. And uh, this is a way to understand uh, uh, the kind of historical genesis of all these disciplines that we experience today. At one time, they all kind of, uh, like I suggested in the last lecture, they evolved or they emerged from, uh, a, you know, a common ex you know, a sort of unified experience, integral experience of life. And, um, and at that time, it wouldn't have made sense to talk about religion. Uh, you wouldn't have need needed a word for something because, uh, because you would not have experienced, uh, you know, its lack, anything in contrast to it. And uh, it's only gradually that, that uh, you know, the secular starts to be contrasted against the, the um, you know, the mundane or the profane. And, uh, and, and that's, a, that, then that's a process that unfolds itself. And in some ways, the divergence uh, increases and then uh, it's possible for it to, to intensify. Um, okay, and so I, uh, now, you know, I hope that I've laid out the, the kind of a historical or diachronic view. And now I'll move to the, the second part. And it's likely, uh, once again, you know, these, these topics, they're just, uh, they're so involved and so, um, again, the, the, the word that occurs to me is holographic. It's like it, it, uh, a single question like this just contains, um, uh, contains so much, uh, you know, the, the, the whole world in some, in some ways, the world in a grain of sand, to quote William Blake. Um, but I'll, I'll say a few words about the, um, the, the more kind of synchronic element and, and it's likely that I will have to, um, it's likely that I will have to pick this up in a, in a, a follow-up lecture. But one thing that I would like to, so going into the second part, 
um, the, the sort of more synchronic or more, uh, yeah, again, trying to approach this not in a historical way, but, but really just uh, in concepts or in principles. Um, one image that I think might be helpful to set before us is uh, different ways of thinking about one. Um, uh, you know, the, the symbol one. Um, you know, the question that we can pose for ourselves is, is, is one, you know, the smallest number or uh, the, greatest, the greatest number? Um, and, and those are different ways of thinking about one. The first way is thinking about one as a unit. And so you, you, um, you get to higher numbers like, um, like, like three. You get from one to three by adding units. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then to get to five, you add more units. And so you have, uh, right, so five units. So one plus one plus one plus one uh, plus one plus one. So you have five units. Um, that's one way to get to, um, to five. And that's and, and, and you know it's it's correlative to a certain understanding of of one, which is one as a unit. There's another way of thinking about one, uh, which is uh, one as the whole, the wholeness. And then every every further uh, integer will actually represent a um, a partitioning of the wholeness. So uh, numbers are actually parts of one. One is the whole. Um, notice. <laughs> Uh, this is actually setting up as a kind of mathematical uh, allegory, I guess, to, uh, to, to uh, what I suggested about science as a method. Um, it's that uh, when we, uh, you know, in, the, in the, the first case, this idea of getting from, you know, one to five by adding units, um, there's no hole to speak of. Yeah, there's, uh, we've, uh, we're, we're approaching it, uh, situation in a way that, that really um, uh, the whole... Uh, the whole there's no hole to speak of to begin with, and if you have if you have if you call, call five the whole, the, if you call five units the whole, um, you are talking about a kind of an abstract assembly, uh, kind of like a heap, uh, not really a whole. Um, again, you, you you couldn't make a face, for instance, which is uh, which is uh, which is a face is not a heap. You could not make a heap by just aggregating units together. There's a sort of uh, there's a logos to it. There's an order to it. There's a wholeness to it. Um, uh, in fact, there's a there's a cosmos to it to use a Greek word, and, and our word cosmetology actually comes from this Greek word of cosmos, which is uh, in some ways the contrast to chaos. So chaos is the opposite of cosmos. If you just add units, you really don't go beyond the the state of chaos because you just have a, a random assemblage of units. Um, and and you know it's the inverse though. If you think of one as wholeness, and then you uh, you partition the wholeness in certain ways, and this gives you um, you know not a, an aggregate. But a ratio, a, uh, a proportion, uh, and and uh, for instance, to get to five, you uh, divide the wholeness in five ways, and um, and just imagine, you know, I, I said about apples. Suppose there's five apples, um, then uh, or so, but it could be five anything. You know, it's just it's really just a heap a heap of things, a heap of units, and and then uh, then we count five of them. But if you took away one or if you added another one, um, it wouldn't it wouldn't actually change the any es essential nature of the thing, because there is no essential nature, it's just a heap. Um, quite on the contrary, if you imagine, I mean, an apple is a perfect example of this, because, uh, you know, the apple blossom itself uh, uh, has, uh, it's a five petaled. Um, if you slice the apple in half, uh, you will discover the pericarp, the, you know, the five pointed star in the center of the apple. Um, this is a, a five that's a, that's a, that illustrates, I guess, like a kind of um, essential uh, fiveness. Uh, that's not a, it's not an accidental fiveness in the sense that there happen to be five, five units here. It's rather the fiveness is, uh, is inherent to the object in question. Okay. And so this is different ways of actually thinking about, thinking about, um, well, I'm, I'm setting this up as actually a, a kind of, uh, analogy to think about the different, the different, uh, uh, approaches of actually science and religion. Um, and I, I, in some ways, illustrated that on the on the diagram before. But it's uh, you know you either start from from wholeness uh, and and uh, and and sort of move out from wholeness into uh, diversity, or you start from uh, start from the um, you know from the from diversity, for lack of a better word. But but you start from particularity and try to work your way back to to wholeness. Um, the second thing. Um, you know, starting with, or, or uh, in, it was actually the first thing that I presented in the mathematical um, uh, analogy. Um, when you start from, when you when you think of one as units, then uh, you you will uh, you will be trying to work your way back to to wholeness. Um, if you th if you think of uh, one as wholeness, then you will you will uh, you will it will be clear to you how 
um, you, uh, you sort of establish a kind of um, hierarchy of meaning and you're able to, to, uh, to um, comprehend uh, all of the individual elements of something in the context of, of their identity uh, as, a, as part of a whole. And I think this is actually helpful for us to think about um, about the contrast between in the two approaches between um, actually like you know almost fundamental ways of, of, of relating to the world between uh, science and religion is that uh, with uh, from from science you are trying to work your way back actually to um, an experience of wholeness and whether that is a uh, you know what they call a theory of everything. Um, but that's a little bit of a, a misleading because really uh, the theory of everything it still is going to leave out all that science um, you know excludes from its uh, from the from the outside of the perimeter of its of its methodology um, that, which includes of course uh, arguably what could be the starting point which is our first person experience um, uh, um, so in, in in other words um, uh, Science will always be trying to, or tr science is always trying to, uh, trying to account for what we do experience in terms of things that we don't experience. Actually, it's trying to work its way back to this wholeness, and whether that's the the wholeness of the the self, the wholeness of experience, or or the wholeness of again the the universe, or the wholeness of um, of uh, you know uh, of God, for instance. Um, it, this is this is uh, again science is always going to be working from the bottom up, so to speak, and in the specific way that I tried to outline. Um, religion, in a way, operates uh, inversely, uh, and it starts from some kind of uh, some kind of wholeness, and um, and then uh, you know proceeds proceeds from the wholeness, um, and and everything that everything that uh, the the entire uh, topology, I guess, is um, is understood in terms of uh, in light of of this uh, this wholeness, and so there's a sort of coherence to it. Um, this is again. I, I in this lecture, I'm, I'm setting up a uh, something of a uh, like a really really uh, tall order because what I'm trying to do actually is is establish uh, neat dichotomies and then actually problematize them and show how they don't actually um, they don't hold up. So they don't really hold water when it comes down to it. Um, but I, I hope that it's it's helpful in this as a kind of a dialectic that I'm carrying on with myself. I guess saying something and contradicting it. Um, you know, it, it, in some ways, it's it's you couldn't really expect to just uh, summarize all of this with in a, in a neat set of propositions. Uh, I, but I'm rather hoping that, that uh, by doing this, it succeeds in um, you know, achieving a kind of uh, familiarity with the subject through a sort of dialectic. Um, so the reason that it doesn't, uh, doesn't actually, what I described is actually um, not as accurate as it might be is because science itself, again, there's a, there's a certain uh, coherence to the, the, the very paradigm of science. Uh, you, you can't really get away from, uh, from formal causes, even if you sweep them under the rug and pretend they don't exist. What I have in mind is that uh, even the concept that uh, you know, the world is the kind of place that's intelligible in terms of, um, you know, I don't know, fundamental forces of physics, that itself is a, itself is a kind of uh, topology. Uh, so again, that, that, that itself is kind of establishing a wholeness and then uh, trying to show, uh, trying to look for evidence to, to confirm it. And that's um, you know that's that's just the way that that theory and evidence uh, correlate to one another. People, in a sort of naive way, imagine that evidence just shows up and, and kind of uh, knocks you about the sconce, like the famous apple, uh, the, the notorious apple that fell on Newton's head, and and uh, and he said, "Eureka! I've uh, you know invented gravity." That's not at all how how, how evidence strikes us. It's rather um, it, there, there's just there's there's in, there are infinite facts and there are infinite observations we can make, and uh, the way we select evidence actually from out of those infinite facts and observations that we can make and infinite infinite information data really, um, the way we actually select evidence and, and and discover something meaningful within that infinite those infinite p potentialities is um, it's already by entertaining uh, one or another theory or paradigm. And so it's only in light of a theory or a paradigm that you're able to uh, recognize evidence as evidence. Uh, and, and so it's, you know, it's extremely naive to just imagine, um, again, to call something, uh, to, to think of as though evidence-based is, is a way to, uh, to, um, to step outside and, and sort of um, stand above any kind of, uh, any kind of theory or any kind of, uh, any kind of paradigm. It's, uh, Rather, it actually confirms the idea of, I mean, it confirms the, the fact of a, a given theory that you're already entertaining. 
Um, you might say, well, then there's no such thing as truth. But uh, another way of looking at it is that well, if we want to learn about truth, uh, let's not start out with a bunch of presuppositions and let's try to discover, um, you know, let's try to inquire into it and study it in its, its natural habitat, so to speak. And then uh, that's what you'll find. It's that evidence doesn't just uh, emerge in a vacuum. It always emerges uh, in a context and, and specifically it always, it always appears uh, in respect to a certain theory or a certain way of understanding it. It's almost the way in which, um, you know, it, it's the, the theory is what allows us to, to uh, distinguish the, the signal from the noise, so to speak, as a metaphor to try to, try to illuminate this. Okay, and so, so I hope the, the idea of, uh, of the, t the, two, uh, the two pictures of, of, of one uh, can be at least helpful, though, in, uh, in, in, in trying to, sort of giving us a heuristic to, to approach this question. Um, and I, um, you know, again, like I said, there, there's so much more that, that, uh, that could be said. And, and, and so, in fact, I think this might be a good place to actually, um, actually draw the lecture to a close. And um, and and resume the lecture, uh, resume the same topic, but but in a different lecture. Uh, so maybe what I'll do is 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 uh, yeah, start to draw this to a close. But but just pose a, a question to pick up in the next um, in the next lecture, which is the idea of um, of how feasible it is actually to uh, to um, to propose uh, objectivity in the way that it's usually understood, which is like. Um, a view from nowhere, uh, and that might be a little bit confusing, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain what I have in mind. Um, we might say that um, that uh, that what we're trying to do to achieve a, an objective um, objective understanding of something is to take away first person perspective, um, and that would be one way of looking at it, the kind of scientific way of looking at it. Um, but but uh, you know the, the the other side of that might be that. Um, might be that uh, the only way to actually understand something is um, is again is you know in some ways by by looking at it uh, through a perspective and so it's it's kind of a question of asking um, you know uh, just it's it's hard I mean I'm, I'm struggling for words obviously anyone can tell but um, take the cup again uh, I use the cup as an illustration for matter and form um, and and here's the cup and and people have a certain uh, perspective on the cup obviously. Uh, and and how intelligible is it really to say, um, you know, what would the cup, what would the cup, uh, you know, how would the cup be, if no one, you know, if if no one were were um, looking at it, I guess, um, how would the cup look to to no one from nowhere? That's the idea of a view from nowhere, uh, and it's it's the it's in some ways it's the scientific ideal, um, and it's we we just we assume that it's it's sensible. Uh, and but I but I hope to um, in the next lecture just kind of uh, pick up on it and explore uh, what it's really suggesting, and um, and how it might be um, well what it can actually reveal to us to uh, to to question that um, that sort of axiom is a way of looking at it, and um, and what I act, uh, what I have in mind in the next lecture is is to uh, is to relate that actually to the idea of uh, having lacking perspective. Um, to actually relate that to uh, a difficulty with with quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity, and the way of um, you know th th they're they're notoriously um, irreconcilable today. Like it's quantum mechanics is seen as the as the domain to understand or the the the, um, the method to understand the very small, the domain of the very small. Uh, general relativity is understood as the the method to understand the domain of the the, the macrocosm. Uh, but it's not clear how they relate to one another, and I think uh, in, in some ways that um, there's a kind of missing there's a missing link, I guess, in the connection, and that is uh, that is the observer, the first person, actually, and uh, we see this in the way that um, you know general relativity. Uh, and I, again, I'll just I'll just briefly outline this and then and pick it up in the next lecture. But but general relativity, it, you know what it what it uh, what it I guess suggests is that there's no um, there's no, it, it's kind of a meaningless question to try to establish, um, try to establish a uh, here and now in space time, so a point in space time. Um, you can't really do that uh, except within a very, um, very uh, close range. Like if you ask, uh, if you ask what time is it, um, or you know, what's happening at this very moment um, on, on a distant star or uh, on the planet Jupiter, 
if you uh, ask a question like that, in some way, uh, it's it's uh, it's like an indeterminate question. It's undefined. You can never answer it um, because of uh, because of uh, you know following the the, the doctrines of Einstein um, that uh, that that space and time themselves actually um, warp and transform. Um, but so the idea is like you, the space and time is only uh, now, I guess, another way to look at it. Nowness is only determined by an observer, uh, or by a point of reference for a, 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 you know, a specific point of reference. And, um, and then I think it's uh, then in, in, in connection to, uh, to uh, quantum mechanics, we see a situation in which um, you, you actually have a kind of uh, non-existence of things or a virtual, a virtual uh, existence of things. Uh, what's sometimes called superposition of uh, these subatomic particles until they are observed and it's obvious that they're always observed at a in a specific now there's a, so in other words you're you're marking them now by observing them uh, but but when you haven't observed them they are the question is again um, uh, you know um, un, uh, indeterminate or uh, to use Heisenberg's term uh, uncertain you are kind of generating uncertainty by um, by not specifying a specific uh, Time in uh, point in time, a specific here and now, um, and and again, it's you know it's uh, in some ways this follows it's a situation that follows from the from uh, from from the lack of this this integrating element, which is um, the first person uh, first person experience, which is has been kind of methodologically excluded from our our view of the world, and uh, and so no matter what you know for for if if science is going to be a comprehensive picture. It's it's going to have to account for um, for you know the single thing that along the in the along the lines of Descartes uh, the single thing that 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 is the starting point for all of uh, any kind of inquiry we do in the first place, which is um, our first person experience. And if you if we're going to if we're going to uh, discount it, we're discounting it. Uh, whether we discount it or affirm it, we're always doing that on the basis of evidence that we do have uh, through our first person perspective. Um, and so. Okay, but but uh, I, I, you know I hope uh, I know I uh, I know the lecture was was quite um, you know tr uh, really trying to uh, trying to integrate a lot of different things, um, a lot of different elements. But I hope that uh, in some way it's um, it can be seen as sort of a, you know like the blind men that are skirting around the elephant and and uh, approaching the element from different different uh, different aspects and uh, but with the understanding that we're trying to form um, we're trying to chart out kind of a a, uh, a topography almost and, and achieve a, um, some kind of um, some kind of vision of, of just what's at stake here and this is much less a question of of, um, of establishing uh, specific um, specific answers or defending any specific points but rather just trying to uh, trying to uh, trying to achieve a kind of vision of, um, of, of the issue itself and and so if this lecture has been in service to that then I uh, then I can't say it's uh, then I can't complain and I can't say it's been anything uh, but a success success uh, and but and so I I'll end there with that hope um, and uh, but of course uh, not before wishing everybody the best and um, and I will try to pick this up in uh, in another lecture so uh, that's all for me farewell until next time